Our theme verse is talking about three things. It's talking about resilient faith. And we talked about that yesterday, that you must stand firm. We talked about the fact that there are dangers of backsliding. We talked about the fact that all of us are in that danger. And if you think you're, if you think you're standing firm, be careful. Because you're actually the one at the most risk. We talked about the fact that if you've been at the same place the last three, four years in your faith, you're actually backsliding. Because God's kingdom is moving forward. So if you're still praying the same way you are praying three years ago, you're actually backsliding, slowly. And you're just not aware of it. And that you need to be careful because you need to be responsible for yourself. Uh, because God will actually require fruitfulness of all of us. And so we talked about what, why is it that it's so important. That's why the Bible tells us, stand firm. It's not just a nice word. It's because <laughs> Paul, who was speaking on behalf of Jesus, he knew that something would move people. And we talked about in the last times, many people, their love of God will grow cold. And we are seeing it happen in our culture today. We are seeing the, the love of many growing cold. We are seeing Christians, even Christians on social media, ridiculing church pastors, ridiculing the church. And it's become this thing where you can make fun about any other religion except, I mean, every, every, you, you can't make fun of other religions except Christianity. And, but you cannot make fun of Christianity enough. And some of the people who are driving this are actually Christians. People who call themselves Christians. And if you ask them why, they say, oh, I'm just trying to purify the church. I'm just talking real things. But you don't know you're being used by the devil. No. Yeah. And there are many, even in this country, being used by the devil to ridicule the body of Christ. Yeah, the body of Christ is, is messed. It's always been messed up. Because it's made of humans. Yeah. But the minute you start ridiculing the body of Christ, what, what, what does that mean? Do you understand what the body of Christ means? It's a body. You can't start making fun of my body and then you think that I can take that kindly. Until you look at Pastor M, look at his pot. Look at, look at how he walks. And then you think we can still be friends. You can't do that. And many Christians are actually backsliding without knowing they are backsliding. It was interesting, this morning I was talking to some of my pastors and some of them said, I didn't even know as a pastor I can actually be backsliding. I can be preaching to people about backsliding, I don't even realize me, myself, and I, we are the ones who are backsliding in the church. Because our love for God has grown cold. And so we talked about the fact that we must not be those people. That's why the scripture tells us, stand firm. Let nothing, let nothing move you. And I believe the people in this church, the people who are in this house today, nothing will move you. Amen. Nothing will move you. So today we want to talk about always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and then we're going to have a mystery guest. Wow. Come on. <laughs> Amen. So, we've been talking about the fact, and I, and I think I might have mentioned this yesterday, that the enemy only takes control of your life, or only affects your life when you let him as a Christian. Because once the Holy Spirit is in you, you have the power to resist the devil and he will flee from you. So if the devil is oppressing you, usually you have to ask yourself, what gateway, what legal right has been given to him to start to oppress me? Because there must be a door. There's a doorway that has been opened. And we've talked about the fact, uh, if you've done Simama, if you had Pastor Caro when she led us in prayer at the beginning of this year, we talked about the fact that there are many doorways. Some of them include family doorways. There are sinful things that were done in our families of origin that sowed the wrong foundations, evil foundations in our lives. And as a believer, it's my job to make sure that I uproot the evil foundations so that they don't affect my children. There are sinful patterns, by the way. When you see those sinful patterns, don't feel like you're immune to them. If, if your family is full of people who are drug dealers or alcoholics, don't ever feel you're immune. It is your job to uproot that evil foundation from your lineage so that the next generation will not have it. And guess, guess what? You may be that generation that does it so that the next generation will not struggle with those things. Yeah. Every generation should become better and better, moving from glory to glory. Your children should not be suffering from the things you suffered from Amen. when it comes to the spiritual realm. And so we must understand there are those family things. There's also things like trauma. When trauma is passed on to us, people who grow up in war, people who experience rape, people who experience violence, uh, people who experience uh, abuse, that that can actually open a doorway uh, in our lives. And we talked about that uh, during that time. Uh, religion, engaging yourself in false religions, that will open the door. Uh, cultic engagement, those things will open the doors and give the enemy a foothold. If you've ever done Mizizi, one of the things that we close and we confess is being involved in Eastern religions, in practices like yoga, 
because many times Christians have, these things have been so sanctified in our culture that we don't even see the danger and the doorways we open. I remember one of my friends who's a, who's a theologian and a greatly esteemed pastor from Asia. And he was here. And Pastor Karen and I asked him, what do you think about Christians practicing yoga? And the man said, they are mad. They are mad. He said, they don't understand what those things are. For us, coming from those religious backgrounds, we, we understand exactly what those chakras and all those positions that you're getting into and what they open you up to. And he said, I see churches even hosting yoga classes in the West. I don't even understand these people because they don't know what they're meddling with. So, so I think it's important to understand there are some things that you need to renounce if you've been involved in them. Rastafarianism. I mean, this thing, some of them look like very small things, but they're actually practices of idolatry and false gods. And so those things actually open up doorways to the enemy. Uh, relation, wrong relationships and sexual involvement. Those things will open up doorways. And some of you might have a sexual past that can actually pass on uh, spirit, wrong spiritual foundations to the next generation. And those things need to be renounced and closed down. The, th the, the good thing about God, he gives us the power to shut down and to uproot evil foundations and to plant the righteous foundations for the next generation. Occultic engagement. Uh, those things will open up doorways. Now, one of the doorways that many people don't know about, and, is, and yet it's an important doorway as well, is the doorway of half-heartedness. Half-heartedness. It's very interesting because half-heartedness, it really implies, you know, it's, it's almost like you're not giving your... Because <laughs> this verse is about giving yourself fully. In other words, wholeheartedly to the work of the Lord. But many times as Christians, we've been taught to treat the things of God lightly. We apply ourselves fully. When you're applying for a degree at Harvard or whatever it is, you apply yourself fully to your studies. You apply, you apply yourself fully to your career. You apply yourself fully to the things that matter. But many times we've not been taught to apply ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. But the scriptures tell us that we must be sober. We must understand that 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, in other words, well-balanced and self-disciplined. This is amplified version. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, in quotes, seeking someone to devour. In other words, you must have a plan of aggression. You can't walk around half-heartedly. There's no soldier who enters into the battlefield half-heartedly. You have to be all in. You can't be wandering around aimlessly in a battlefield as the bullets are going on around you because you're the first one who will die. <laughs> you need to understand, at that point, you have to be fully alert because there's an enemy who is seeking to devour you. But many times as, Christ as Christians, we are half-hearted in the way we engage in the battlefield. It's interesting because God ex expects us to be full-hearted, whole-hearted in two, at least two areas. Two areas where you must be full-hearted. Number one, in our love for God. Our love for God. Uh, it's interesting because Jesus quoted the words of Deuteronomy that say, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in fact, Jesus said, with all your mind and with all your strength. In other words, there is no portion of your life that is exempt from loving God. Like he's saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We prayed about that this morning. Pastor Faith led us in praying. Like all my passion should be in this thing. It's like my emotions should get into it. That's what I was saying yesterday. You can't love God in a dignified way. You can't love God in an unemotional way. Because that means there's a part of your love that is stunted. So you have to, you have to actually ask God to teach you how to be emotional with him. How to actually get engaged. It's interesting. I was talking to somebody. I won't reveal who it is. But the person told me he, he's never prayed aloud. But yesterday he decided, let me try aloud and just see what happens. Because everybody's praying aloud. And he said, as I started praying aloud, I just felt emotions coming. Wow. Like I felt tears in my eyes and I wondered, what's going on? Wow. And I told him, what's going on is that you started to experience the presence of God. Yeah. yeah? God wants us to also experience him emotionally. Wow. With our passions. Yeah, to love him fiercely. He wants that. But he also says, with all your soul. Your soul is your motivation. It's what drives you. You know, we are driven by money. We are driven by ambition. We are driven by career. We are driven by approval of what other people think. But God is saying, I want to be the thing that drives you. 
I, I want you to get to the place where it, when you wake up, the thing that's driving you is, man, I want to pray. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, I want to hear God's voice. I want to serve God. I want to know God with all my heart. Paul says, I want to know him. Uh, the power of his resurrection, the, the fellowship of even sharing in his suffering. Like, I want to know God so much, I'll do anything. That's what Paul was saying. And God is saying, I want to be your motivation. He says, love the Lord God with all your mind. My goodness, we apply our mind for many things. Many of you are so smart. You use your mind for important things. God is saying, I want you to love with your mind as well. Yeah. I want you to actually study me. When, you get, when you're reading the New Testament, by the way, don't, don't just read it and then, okay, tick, I've read. There's something that you won't understand. Go on to this. By the way, nowadays, in fact, we live in such good times. You don't need a Bible encyclopedia. Just go on to Google. What does the parable of the two servants mean? And you're going to see many different, you can actually read a few of them. And you actually, oh, wow, I didn't know this. This is what theologians say it means. It broadens your mind. Take time to actually study the word. Maybe invest in a Bible encyclopedia and be able to say, I want to actually know God's word well. I don't just want to know God with my heart and my passion. I also want to know him with my mind. Maybe you need to understand issues. I mean, it's very interesting because some people, I know people who've dedicated their lives towards studying the word of God. Uh, and to be able to understand the issues of today's world according to God's word. What, 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 what does it mean that they're dinosaurs? Does that mean that the creation is a myth? What does it mean that they are fossils? Like, what does that even mean? Like, how did God create the world and yet there are fossils of animals that are not mentioned in Genesis? You should be able to find that out. And to be able to say, oh my goodness, what does it mean when the Bible gives us a timeline that seems like it's somewhere like 6,000, 7,000 years since creation, and yet the fossil record, we are told, is of billions of years. Is the Bible a lie? Or is, there, is it possible that there's actually more to it than the scientists tell us? By the way, I studied science. I can tell you, my goodness. Hey, scientists. This one you never hear from a scientist, but scientists are like mechanics. You know how the mechanic comes and tells you, leave me your car? <laughs> okay, nowadays mechanics are better. At least they have computers. The computer tells them what's wrong. Those days you'd, you'd leave a guy, he has no idea what it is. First thing he does, he gets a caspana and just hits things. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> then the car starts working. He says, hey, 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 now, what happened? Eh? We had to change the dream. <laughs> the alternator was having problems. <coughs> Many times we work from what we know into what we don't know. And what we know is a lot less than what we don't know. Most scientists will not tell you that. They won't tell you that a lot of what the theory of evolution teaches is actually not, in fact, the theory of evolution doesn't qualify to be called a theory. It's a hypothesis. Because it lacks the evidence of proof to make it a real theory. Yeah. And yet, whole school systems have been built on the fact that one, from one cell, one amoeba, a whole, a whole distinct human being with thinking and sentient ability came out of that one cell. Like there's no, absolutely nothing in creation that shows such a thing can actually occur. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. There's, one, there's one, one cell. One cell organisms actually uh, exist. There are many of them. The ones we supposedly came from. But I don't know if you know there's no such thing as a two-cell organism. Anywhere. It's never been discovered. There's no such thing as a three-cell organism. There's no such thing as a four-cell organism. There's no such thing as a five-cell organism. So how did you come out of one cell? If there's no trace, there should be a trace of other organisms that are now evolving. I mean, there are things that people just don't think, because we are told in class that all of us came from an amoeba, and that's how we became. And all of us have just all assumed, oh, wow, okay, that's how we are. I'm just one step next to a Neanderthal, you know. I'm just moving from an ape. Even our museums now have this picture of the ki ape, then all of a sudden they became. And that's what we teach our children. And yet, this is a hypothesis that Darwin came up with many years ago. Yes, there is distinction, there's natural selection within species. But to jump from that, okay, now I'm teaching you science. <laughs> the point I was making is love the Lord your God with all your mind. Learn to think about the issues in your life according to scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. 
Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your strength. He's saying, use your strength to love me. Use the energy I've given you to love me. Be passionate about loving me. Come early to church and serve. Use your strength. We use our strength for everything else. We hustle. We use our hustle for our kingdoms. God is saying, use that hustle for my kingdom as well. Yeah. So love the Lord your God with all those things. God is saying he wants us to be wholehearted in our love for him. The other thing he wants us to be wholehearted in is in our stand against the enemy. God does not want half-hearted soldiers. And I talked about that. He wants wholehearted people because we have an enemy. And that's why in the Bible, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Put to death. I mean, those are not, that's not the language of half-heartedness. It's, it's telling you, by the way, you're struggling with porn. Put it to death. Like putting to death means kill it. In fact, Jesus at one point said, it is better you pluck out the eye. And you go to, it's better to go to heaven with one eye. <laughs> or to meet your Savior with one eye, he'll restore it. Than to go to hell with two eyes. It's like, be aggressive in your stance against sin. Be aggressive in your stance against the enemy. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God. So you can take your stand against the devil's evil schemes. Uh, and he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Uh, but against the rulers, we talked about that. And then verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God, so when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand. Yeah? He's like, look, you're not just going to stand if you're not wearing armor. You actually have to, when the, the evil day will come. He doesn't say if the evil day comes. He says when the evil day comes. And remember, we've said that evil day will come. So he's saying when that day comes, let it find you standing your ground because you've put on God's armor. And God's armor is put on in prayer. The thing you're doing now in aggressive prayer, training yourself for aggressive prayer, it's helping you for the evil day. Yeah. Because when that day comes, you will be able to stand. So, so God wants us to be wholehearted. Wholehearted in seeking him and wholehearted in standing against the enemy. And it's interesting because Paul, Paul is a guy for me who, I love Paul. Paul is my patron saint. Yeah. If you talk about people who, the, the person, all of us, I'm sure there's a person in the Bible you just resonate with their stories. There's this guy or this girl where you read the story and like, that's me. For me, it's the Apostle Paul. Because Paul was that guy who just was dead. He considered himself a dead man walking. He said, I've been crucified in Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. He says, the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise God for the Mizizi graduates in the room. <laughs> they know that verse I mean that, that's a powerful verse because it's saying for Paul it's like if you beat him he's like but I'm dead dead men have no feelings they don't catch feelings they go back and they preach the gospel after being beaten most of us by the way if you're beaten for preaching you'd be gone you'd be, la you'd be you'd, the last sin you know it's like how could I have served God and then he let me suffer how could I have come to preach and then there's no electricity but let me just tell you something. When, when I see such things, I just laugh. Because the Apostle Paul was beaten and he still preached. I'm like, we think electricity will stop me from preaching. Are you mad? Somebody's going to be crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's so foolish. The work of God will go on. Yeah. Paul was crucified. He's like, I'm not here for my reputation. I'm here to, do, I'm here to deliver what God has asked me to deliver. And I will deliver it by hook or crook. Yeah? He's crucified in Christ. God wants us to be aggressive wholehearted in our faith. Now, why are some people half-hearted? I'm going to give you a few reasons for half-heartedness. When we see half-heartedness among Christians, the thing that causes people not to be always giving themselves fully, there are certain reasons that cause people not to give themselves fully to God's work. The first is neglect. And what do I mean by neglect? I'm talking about a person who was neglected growing up, who then gained a sense of walking through life with a view of being a victim. Yeah. I wasn't looked after. <laughs> uh, there's a sense of self-pity. There's a sense of, I don't have agency. There's a word called agency. Agency means I have the ability to make things happen. And many times, depending on your upbringing, you can feel I actually can't control my circumstances. Things happen to me. Many times you find people who grow up in difficult circumstances, they just grow up feeling things happen to me. Us, we just have things happen to us. This is how we are. 
We don't have power to change our circumstances. We just lie our heads low and hope nobody notices us. And there are many Christians who walk in that way because of their background. You feel you can't make a difference because of your bloodline. And that's what, teach, that's what happens when, you're neglect, when you come from a home where you're not taught you can actually do things. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I watched um, American, my American friends when I lived there bringing up their children. They bring them up very differently from us. One of the things a young American child is taught is they teach you when you're very young. Look me in the eye when you're talking to me. Speak with authority when you're talking to me. Don't look down. And they speak with a lot of aggression, like they know, even when they don't. But as a result, they grow up believing they can do it. Even when, a, even when an American doesn't know what to do, they still do it. And they do it with boldness because it's like, I'll do it and I'll figure it out. They know how to fake it until they make it. Yeah, it's true. And I admire their culture for that. We must learn to be bold as well. Because we've, sometimes because of neglect, we are taught to be shy. By the way, don't go away when the lights come on. I'm loving this church. <laughs> I'm loving the church. Uh, I, don't, don't run away. Let's stay here. Let the people who come in be shocked. I'm sure there's some people who came in and they're like, ah. What, what happened to our church? <laughs> what revival is going on in this church? There's a choir on stage, mass choir. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. My wife, she does a lot of, she helps a lot of people with prayer, spiritual warfare. And one of the things she teaches us is how to redeem our bloodlines. I'm sure you've benefited from those, from that teaching. But there's something she said today that really caught my attention. She said, you know some people, their bloodlines are so messed up that when I hear their stories, I'm just like, let's forget that bloodline. Let me just give you a new bloodline. <laughs> Let me adopt you into my bloodline. We just move on from here. <laughs> let's, let's just move on from here. Let's, that one of yours, let's just leave it. When someone has told you, Siju, we are all grandmasters in witchcraft. We are Siju, who we are dedicated. We are what? You're like, hey, that one. Let's just leave that one. To in the lane, let's make a new one now. But you know, the funny thing is, him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God and so what she's saying is actually accurate there's a place where you have to say there are some things I cannot redeem there's some things that I just lost in the past and I know my family had no agency but it starts with me I am a child of God I need to actually drum it into my head I'm a child of God I have authority I can do things there are people who are poor and they did big things I'm not going to be the one who's going to die in poverty because my family people are always poor no, that's not me. I'm not be going to be the one who had children out of wedlock because that was my family of origin. I have cut myself off from that. I've adopted, I'm adopted as a child of God. Yeah. And I will move forward. And that's one of the reasons why you hear Pastor Caro and I talk about the qualities of this house. It's not an, an idle thing. It's because we're saying, I don't care what background you came in. Once you come into this church and you're a spiritual son and daughter of this house, the heritage of this house is good marriages. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's actually a spiritual statement. I'm actually saying, disconnect yourself from the, a negative bloodline and say, this, in this church, this is the bloodline in this church. In this bloodline, we don't do divorce. No, it's not. I know everybody in my family is divorced. It's not going to happen to us. We belong to this family. We will fight for our marriage. So I think there are things you just need to understand. Even if that was your background, that was your past. Paul says, forgetting all that is behind me. You must forget some of those things and choose to hold on to what God has put you in, in this season. Amen. Amen. Am I preaching good? Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm helping your neighbor. Amen. <laughs> Number two, fear. Number two reason for half-heartedness is fear. Many people are half-hearted. I don't know. The, fear is just a thing that keeps Christians half-hearted in their, in their serving God. Some people ask questions like, will I have the energy and resources? What if, I, what if I have too much zeal and then I run out? Should I pace myself? Some people might burn out because they love God too much. Maybe I should hold back because this is a marathon. You know the question I ask somebody like that is I say, hey, just try and tell your wife that. Because we're going to love each other for life. Let me not be too passionate about you right now. I'll just give you a bit. Ah. Are you hearing how the wives are responding? Like, what? <laughs> I want it all and I want it now. Yeah. And that's how God is with us. I want your love and I want it now. Don't worry about the future. We'll figure it out together. 
Yeah, but fear will keep you from loving God because you're like, what if I burn out? What if I get excited and then I fail and then people see I've failed? That's, a, that's one of the words that, what, what if God calls me to do something I didn't want to do? I get too close to him and then he asks me to leave my job. You know, some people serve God from a distance because I don't want God to ask me for things that I'm not ready to give up. What if I end up being poor because of serving God? What if, I've, what, what if, what if I engage God too much and then he notices me? <laughs> yeah, I, I get too close and then God is, ah, oh, you're here? Aha, come, come, come. <laughs> Go to Mogadishu, yes. <laughs> I tell, fear is ridiculous. Fear is ridiculous. You know, it's interesting. Many people end up serving at their comfort zone because of that fear. But I told you yesterday, fear is a spirit. There is no such... That, I've come to conclude, fear is not an emotion. It is always driven by a spirit. And when I feel fear, I always say that to the fear, get thee behind me. Any fear. Some of you are very fearful. You need to understand, this is a doorway the enemy uses to afflict you. You need to start taking authority over that fear. Speak to it. It's not you. You know, the thing about, this, about Satan is many times what he does, he actually, I've told you guys this before, he, he is a master of deception. He comes and whispers in the first person singular. So he comes and tells you, I am feeling fearful. You think it is you who is feeling fearful. Yet it's a demon. Yeah. And you, you, because you don't know, you say, yeah, you know, I'm really feeling fearful today. <laughs> Why are you agreeing with Satan? You need to say, no, I'm not feeling fear. I bind that spirit right now in Jesus' name and I cast you out of this place. Yeah, take it captive. You take that thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. That's what the scripture teaches you. By the way, I grew up seeing my mom doing that. And when I was a kid, I thought, hey, this is a bit, she's a bit extra. <laughs> this is too extra. But I've come to understand. My mom would say things like, uh-uh, I can, I'm feel, how can I be feeling sick? That's a lie. I take that authority right now over that in Jesus' name. I have work to do for God today, and she'd go to her work. <laughs> I just look at her and say, hey, mom, you're in denial. <laughs> but since, I've since come to admire that woman and to understand she had a mastery over herself. Listen to the devil and have debates with him. You must take control of fear. It will keep you half-hearted in your serving God. You're going to find yourself sitting in the back row when people are moving. People who came into church recently have moved and passed you. Yeah. And you're there with all your experience because of fear. Ha, ah, say, that's not my portion. Not my it's not your portion in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Indiscipline is the next one. Speaking of self-discipline. Indiscipline is the next one. <laughs> indiscipline will keep you half-hearted in your faith it will actually do that if you you know the, the thing about children who are brought up without being disciplined they grow up like wild weeds and they're unaware of the ability to discipline themselves if you don't discipline your child they won't know how to discipline themselves and they will grow up without any discipline. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child, Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Yeah. Proverbs 22, verse 15, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Some of those things sound very primitive if you listen to modern psychologists. Huh? They tell you, ah, don't, that is violence. You're teaching your child violence. Tell your child to go and sit in the naughty corner. Uh, you're, you're causing tra trauma. Huh? Naughty corner. You know, it's interesting. When we did our layer class for teenagers, um, one of the people in the class was a psychologist from, from Europe who was not a Christian. Very, very humbly sat in that class, being taught by uh, Mr. Anzaya, who uh, is completely, as you know, Bible-based. And when she was asked what she was doing in the class, because she's not a believer, she said, I have tried all the things modern psychology has taught me about bringing up a child. And now my child is a teenager, I realize I've made a big mistake. And she said, I used to know these things because I grew up in a Christian home. So I finally come back to just be taught from the Bible how I should have brought up my child. And to find out, is it too late for me? Listen, modern psychology will lie to you. Yeah. yeah. The road, the, when the Bible said the road of correction, in fact, we used to even have one written, the road of correction in our house. Yeah. Or oh, yours is called love and happiness. Yeah. Actually, the other one was called wisdom. 
you know? We apply wisdom. And it works. And when you do the layer class we teach you, you never do it in anger. You never do it in violence. You never do it uh, to, to revenge. It is always done in love. And it's always done in a measured way. And when you understand it, my goodness, your child grows up with high respect. They actually respect and they appreciate you for doing it. Discipline is not punishment, but it has to do with training. And when you're overprotective for your child, you excuse their bad behavior, that child will grow up expecting other people to take care of them. They have no sense of responsibility. And many Christians have grown up with no sense of responsibility. And because of that, you have no discipline. You start something, you quit. You join a ministry, you quit. You start a Bible study, you quit. You, and because of indiscipline, you're going to be always half-hearted because you never finish what you start. You know, it's interesting. If those of you who played sports in high school, especially for high school teams, you probably realize, or beyond that, you probably realize that your body, your body lies a lot to you. Yeah, your, bo your body's a liar. Ah, ah. It just tells you, ah, ah, today's not the day I can wake up. Ah, in fact, even my eyes are feeling so bad. Let's just sleep another half hour. We see whether we feel better. That's your body speaking to you. Yeah. Uh, your body is a liar. That's why there's a body, there's a, there's a discipleship group in Mavuno Lovington called Beat Your Body DG. <laughs> uh, come on, Lucas. Because that, that, what, what, what you're really saying is, I, Paul says, I beat my body to make it my slave. Yeah. I learned to do stuff. I learned to manage my time. In sports, that's what you had to do. Because when we played sports, we had to read. We, had, we, went, we were not excused from any classes everybody else went to. We did all the classes everybody else did, plus we did all the sports. And what that meant is I had to be twice as disciplined as the person who wasn't playing sports. Yeah, and it taught me to beat my body. Uh, and I thank God that for those of you who are not in sports, we are teaching you through fasting. <laughs> yeah, beat that body. It tells you, ah, I'm about to die. You have to give me steak. Chips. The neighbor's chapatis. I have to eat. You tell it, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Somebody's got to die. Yeah, and it's you who's dying. <laughs> yeah. and, you wake, and, and you wake up the next day and you're fine. And you tell your body, you see? Huh? You never died. You're still here. <laughs> In fact, you even look better. Huh? <laughs> now drink more water. <laughs> and you know, it's interesting because if you are not taught discipline, then you find you struggle with the things of God. So I think one of the things you need to understand is the church is the place for parenting. Discipleship is parenting. We keep saying that with Pastor Carol all the time. It's such a powerful thing because when you're in a discipleship group, when you're a disciple group leader, what you're really doing is looking at the areas of indiscipline in your people's lives and helping them to do things that their parents never taught them. Yeah. The things that I teach my disciples, many of the things are the things their parents never taught them that will hinder them from becoming everything they're supposed to become. And so that is what you, ha you have to overcome in discipline if you will be a whole heart, if you give yourself fully to God's service. Another one is laziness. Number four, laziness. Yeah? I'm muted. <laughs> That's the beauty of no technology. You can't mute me. <laughs> I am fully in control of this system. <laughs> Yeah. But there are many of you, you are taught by your mothers not to be lazy. Yeah. By the way, when I was a teenager, I could not, you know how teenagers say, how they say teenagers need more sleep. They sleep until midday. Huh? Whose house? Whose mother? <laughs> huh? Yeah, sleep or sleepers. You know, you'll just get some sleepers on your behind. You could not sleep like that in my mother's house. You woke up and you, at you're tired. What? Tired what? Even us, we're tired. Kwanza, which job do you have that you're tired? Me, I was at work the whole day and I'm awake making tea. Wake up, you know. And my mom would wake you up, not because there was anything to do. It's daylight. Wake up. <laughs> I love it. She was teaching us not to be lazy. In fact, by the way, in my, in, in my mom's house, if you're asleep, she'd be like, oh, you don't have enough work. <laughs> so you your chores going up by a certain component. Until you're like, let me just wake up. Because when I oversleep, work is added, you know. So... <laughs> She was teaching me to be industrious. Proverbs 26, verse 14, As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. Proverbs 26, verse 14. You know, a door, a, a, you just see a door going, <laughs> saying that's what a sluggard does in the bed. They're just turning aimlessly. 
Then the other side, Eek! and it's because nobody taught them that laziness will destroy them. And so find ways to be industrious. You know, it's interesting because when, 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 um, when, 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 when we become lazy as Christians, then what happens is we become lazy in our faith. When we are lazy already, then we bring that into the faith area. We become too lazy to pray consistently. We become too lazy to fast. We become too lazy to read the word. You know, there's, there's a verse, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Paul had seen the lazy members of the church. And he wrote to them and said, 1 Timothy 5, 8, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, he's saying, Guy, I know you don't have a job, but don't sleep. Go and look for work. Go volunteer somewhere. Make yourself busy. Something will happen when you're out of bed. Nothing will happen while you're in bed. That's what he's saying. He's like, like, like you're worse than an unbeliever. That's a horrible thing to say. Eh? He's like, I'm even, maybe I was even saying prayers in bed. He's like, no, you're worse than an unbeliever. Get up. Don't be lazy. And, and maybe that's what I'm saying about church being a place of parenting. Because that's the thing a parent should have said to those people. Yeah, you're being worse than an unbeliever. Get up. Provide for your family. Figure out something. Get up on the road. I know you don't have a job, but come on, dress up and go out and look. Look, you'll find something. Stop even looking for something you're qualified for. Just find something. Yeah. Bring something home. You know, if you have the zeal, something will come up. Because you're out there looking for it. But if you're in bed, you will not see anything. You won't. And that's the thing about laziness. is that you're, you're here in bed thinking God has an answer. What is God answering and you're not even praying? Get up! Perhaps you've been praying and it's been three years of prayer, but perhaps this is the day you'll wake up and there'll be a miracle. Get up! Because it's not going to happen while you're asleep. Get up and serve God. I, I mean, it's interesting because all of us, I mean, we like, we, I like leasure. I like rest. But you know, it's yeah, soft life. Soft life is a good thing. But you know the thing is, when I compare, sometimes it, you need to surround yourself with industrious people. Because when you do, then you are able to actually realize, I need to upgrade a bit. If you are surrounded by everybody who is soft life around you, you are going to end up really in a bad place. I have some friends who are really like, 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 like those guys get things done. Like one of my our good friends is a, like, uh, he's a good, he's a doctor, married to a doctor. They are, uh, I mean, one of the top surgeons in the country. He's got a crazy, crazy schedule. He runs, uh, in addition to being that uh, surgeon, cardiovascular surgeon, he's also running uh, with his wife an amazing marriage ministry that reaches thousands of people across the world. Uh, he's also a missionary as well. Uh, he goes out uh, preaching the gospel in different countries. Uh, in addition to that, his wife runs this uh, Keep Fit program uh, that, that is, is, is reaching many, many people. She does it on YouTube. She records videos for every week on YouTube in the year. I look at them, I'm like, hey, okay, Sawa, uh, my friend, wake up. Uh, you're sleeping. You, you hang out with people like those and you realize, I just need to get a bit more serious. I, I, I tell you about Bishop Doug. Bishop Doug is actually a medical trained doctor. There's some, but any medical doctors in the house, any doctors or vets, are they here? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Respect. Respect. This, this guy is not taught not to play. Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh -huh. This one here. Don't joke with them. But they were taught not to play. Because even in their studies, the kind of work these guys had to do to qualify was insane. And so they were taught sleep. What is sleep? What is that? Why do I need sleep? For who? Yeah, people are dying. How am I sleeping? Because I it was animals are dying. Why am I sleeping? Yeah? Animals are giving birth in the night and I'm asleep. Why? So, so while you are deeper asleep in campus, guys, there are people here who are awake almost through the five or seven years of their training. And because of that, they come out with a certain mentality. They can work hard. And many of them, by the way, become phenomenal believers. Because they understand, I can beat my body and make it my slave. Guys, surround yourself with industrious Christians. And look for people who are productive and fruitful. Because you'll end up becoming the sum total of the people you surround yourself with. Don't surround yourself with lazy Christians. Number five, sin. Sin, of course, you know. It's one of the things that would definitely make you a half-hearted Christian. When we break God's moral boundaries, 
then we find it very hard to have the willpower. I don't know what it is. Sin just punches the tire of your faith. It's just that nail that punches the tire of your faith. And it's very interesting because God's commands are about the will. You shall not. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. You shall not. It's because he knows we have to choose. It's always a choice. Sin is a choice that we make. Rebelling to God is a choice. Against God is a choice that we make. And you know what happens? Sin always ensnares. Sin always ensnares. You start sin, it just pulls you. You give a bribe today, you will give another one tomorrow. You watch pornography today, you will watch it tomorrow. You start a drinking habit, you will continue. It just has a way of just enticing you slowly and pulling you. It's interesting because one of the things I, I came to understand about myself, I, I, you, know, you need to know yourself. One of the things I know about myself is I'm, I'm an addictive personality. I don't know whether there's anything like that. My wife has never taught me that in psychology, but I can see it in myself. I'm the kind of person who can easily get obsessed about something. And when I start something, if I lock myself in it, I'll be lost. So I easily could tell myself, if I start drinking, I'm the kind of girl who will easily become an alcoholic. If I start smoking, I will easily get... Because I'm the kind of person who does things fully. <laughs> Anything, I do it fully. My wife can tell you, I can't start a good series and not finish it then. I'm not that person who can watch a TV series today and then I say, ah, next Monday I'll watch another one. I can't. I'm that person who is fully, if, I, if I'm going to, so guess what? I don't watch TV series. I don't, because I realize I'm addictive. I will watch it and it will consume me. And it's like 24 hours later of TV, I'll be thinking, what was that about? <laughs> yeah. Am I talking to somebody in the house? <laughs> oh, that was you, Pastor B. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, so I think I know myself. You need to know yourself. I know I'm the kind of person, if I started watching porn today, I'd be lost. I just know myself. I'm an addictive personality. So, by the way, I don't even look a second time. A cast pop-up comes, poop, gone. I don't even want it. I, I'm watching a thing, and they, they show a scene. I'm like, okay, next movie. Yeah, because I just, I'm that person. I have to control. That's why I don't have a TV in my house. Yeah, my wife can, I mean, I'm the, I'm, I, 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 I grew up in families where TV, you walk in the door and the TV is on. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And it's not at night, it's like two o'clock and TV, Citizen TV is showing Fred Machoka Roga Roga or whoever it is. <laughs> and the TV is just on the whole day. I can't do that. For me, I, I just know myself. If I start, it'll become a habit. So as a result, I'm like... Uh -uh. I'm not going to have one. So we have a projector, which can, we can connect to a computer once in a while, and we watch a movie on the wall. Uh, and it's just the way we control, because you can't put a projector on the whole day. <laughs> even people think you're ridiculous. First of all, it doesn't even look very nice in the daytime. So it's just one of those ways that I have managed. So, so you have to know yourself. What are those areas of weakness in your life? And then like Joseph, run away. Yeah, you move away. The Bible says resist the devil. It says flee from sin. <laughs> you, don't, you don't resist sin by coming into it. Abu, let me watch this thing and see whether I can resist it. <laughs> That's foolishness. Sin will sabotage your ability to love God. That's why Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus was like, man, resist that sin. Sin is the thing that will cause you, by the way, you won't enjoy prayer. Yeah. If you know you're out of order in one area, you just, you become into prayer and you just feel there's something wrong. You come into God's presence, you don't even enjoy God's presence. So the best thing is just deal with it, finish, confess, get out of it, and don't go back there. Because sin will make you half-hearted. Number six, and this is the last one, is bondage. Bondage is interesting because it's it springs from sin, but not your sin. It is a sin of people around you, people who had authority, people in your family. And we talked about it earlier. It affects the sins of people who have gone before us. And we find that the sins of parents can affect their children negatively. We learned that in the sin of Achan, isn't it? That our sins can actually affect our children and the children after them. Some people just find themselves cold towards spiritual things. It's hard to pray. I just find it's hard to pray. When I come to God, I just don't even feel anything. 
I'm like there and I'm trying to say the words and it just feels like I'm being fake. By the way, sometimes you need to understand it's not you. There are things that have happened that have caused you to be distant from God. And it's just a coldness. And when you look around in your family, many times you'll also see the same thing happening. You find people who are just resistant to the gospel, hard-hearted towards God. And there are, I know Christians who even struggle with blasphemous thoughts or just random lustful thoughts that didn't come from you. You're even confused. Where did this thought come from? And it's just something that has been sown into your bloodline. Uh, some people find it so difficult to concentrate during prayer. And you just find people are hostile towards God. Those are things that could end up being, when you explore them, you could actually find their bloodlines. And many times when I pray for somebody in that situation, usually I'll always find there's something that happened in their bloodline that caused that coldness towards God. Something that just resists people in that family coming close towards God. You know, Judges chapter 6, verse 25, verse 2 to 27, it tells us something powerful. It tells us that God has given us authority to break strongholds in our family. It's interesting, when God wants to use you, many times he will actually lead you into breaking those strongholds. And I believe if you want to be used by God, that's one of the things you start to do. And that's why Pastor Caro led us in those prayers. Uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 25 says, Tear down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. And Gideon took ten of his servants and did what the Lord had told him. But because of his, uh, he was afraid of his family and townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. So Gideon destroyed his father's altar. He destroyed those generational things. Priesthood of Baal in his family. He destroyed it. I love the fact that he was afraid, but he did it anyway. Yeah, because you know the thing about being fearless. People think fearless means you don't feel the emotion of fear. Fearless means you do it anyway. Yeah, I'm feeling fearless, but I'm going to do it anyway. I take this thing on and I tear it down. And I believe that God wants us to tear down any of those strongholds, any of those evil foundations. I love the fact that I think Pastor Caro, you've really had a heart for this. And you've really pushed us to pray about this. Even when we pray as the exec team, that's one of the things she's led us into praying. Uh, if you've read the book, Simama, I've done that course. That, that again came from her. And she really has had a passion to help. And part of it is because she was going through it herself. You know? And so she knew, I have to destroy the altars in my family because I'm that first generation Christian. You know, for those of you who've been children of bishops uh, and, grand, and grandchildren, some of those altars were destroyed in your family. So you even wonder why people are even talking about such issues. Someone else did the hard work for you. So now you're living. In fact, your danger is laziness. Yeah, that's what happens to second, third generation Christians. Because you're not feeling the, the urgency. When somebody else is crying to God, oh God, help my family. You're even wondering, why are you so emotional in church? Because <laughs> somebody else cried. And that's where you're where you are, isn't it? So le let people deal with their family issues. In fact, ask God to give you desperation because you still have issues you're passing on to your children that you should be also uprooting and taking charge. So that by the fifth generation of your family, there will be a clean, there will be a clean bloodline. By the way, I, I, I really believe that, that if my children love God and I pray they do as much as we do, and they also deal, because we've made life easy for them, we've dealt with certain issues that my parents did not deal with. If they deal with the issues that they see in their own lives, I, my belief is a fifth generation of our family people will just be hearing revelation as they're walking. They'll just be saying, dear Jesus, they hear, yes. <laughs> there'll be no filters. They'll, they'll, just be, they'll just be a close, of course they'll have to make a choice to follow God. I'm not saying that they won't have to, but they'll find it easy. And the reason is because I've seen families where that is the case, where people find it easy to connect with God. And it's because it's been, there's just t strongholds that have been torn down over generations. Now, I want you to notice the one reason I didn't give for being half-hearted, and that is personality. Your temperament is not an excuse. It is not an excuse. Every temperament, by the way, has, a, has an excuse, can give an excuse, and has a reason for half-heartedness. If you're a phleg, if you're a phlegmatic, your issue can be fear. Because phlegmatics generally struggle with fear. Fear is a thing that will keep them easily from serving God. But you need to understand, it's not just a flake thing. Sanguines can be half-hearted because of indiscipline. Uh -huh. Sanguines in the house. Am I talking to somebody here? Yeah. They know themselves. When I was talking in discipline, they were looking down. I could even see, you know? 
Melancholics can be half-hearted because of over-analysis. Paralysis of analysis. They're always like, should I raise my hands now? Uh, uh, okay, the moment passed. It's like, everything has to be thought through. And your over-analysis just causes you to miss what the spirit is doing. That's melancholics. Uh, cholerics can be half-hearted because of selfishness. Cholerics in the house, they tend to think of themselves first. And what am I getting out of this? And because of that, God can easily miss them by it. So, so all of us, we're sinners. Every temperament. So temperament is not an excuse. Every one of us has an inclination that can cause us to miss out on being wholehearted. But what does God say? Always give yourself fully to the heart of the Lord. Yeah, that's what God is saying. Give yourself fully. And why can't you be half-hearted? I'm going to end with this and then we're going to talk afterwards, my next session before the guest comes, I'm going to talk about a very important thing because I believe it's a, libera it's going to be a, it's a liberating thing for your service of God. Uh, it's something that for me has liberated my thinking. It's changed my thinking about serving God wholeheartedly. And so, but let me give you the reasons why you can't afford to be half-hearted. Regardless of all those things we've said that will cause you to want to try to be half-hearted. This is not an excuse. You cannot... It is not even something you should consider or think about. Number one, you grow or die. Hey, yeah, even the technology has confirmed. You grow or you die. If you're not growing, you're dying as a Christian. We talked about that in Hebrews 5.12 yesterday. He talks about the fact that even though you ought to be teachers, you still require someone to teach you the basics. You need milk and not solid food. Either you're moving forward or you're backsliding. It's just the way it is in the Christian life. It's almost, it's like school. In school, if you're doing the same exam today that you did a year ago, it means you repeat it. Isn't it? In school, either you're moving forward or you're failing. It's the same thing in the Christian life. You have to be moving forward. You have to be making progress. Every year you have to be growing. You have to be becoming better. You have to be loving God more. You have to be getting insights about Him. You must desire those things because this is how we grow. Assess your Christian life. Are you still doing the same things you were doing two years ago? Are you still giving the same testimony you were giving a year ago? Praise God. God saved me when I was 16. Yes, He did. But what has He done since then? There must be testimonies. You should have to... I love people who say, I have a testimony from yesterday. Yeah. I don't have to wait even for the one of last year. Even now I have a testimony. God has done it. Why? And you know, God does, God does miracles for people who are expectant of miracles. So there are people who are sitting next to you he's already done a miracle today. Yeah, because their hearts are open. They're ready. They're growing. They know they don't know. You know, the problem is when you know, you know. Then God just passes you and goes to the people who know they don't know and who know they need him. So grow. Desire to grow. Be humble. Learn even from a new Christian. Yeah, never become that person who knows it all. Be willing to listen because you always learn something. I love, I love King David. King David was walking and he was being stoned by some descendant of Saul, uh, some, uh, a guy called Shimei. And the guy was calling him names because now he had been kicked out of being a king. You're no longer king. You thought you were so big. And you, he cursed him. And, and one of David's guys said, shall I cut off his head? And then he said, no, no, leave him. Maybe there's something I need to hear from God. That's, I love that. He's like, let the critics talk because maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe I need to hear a bit more and listen. By the way, when people criticize me, I, I don't usually tell them, in fact, I, don't, I never tell them, stop talking. I'm always like, okay, come, tell me what it is. I want to hear genuinely, because I'm not perfect. You might highlight something in me that I don't know. You might show me an error that I could fall into. And my prayer is, God, keep me humble so I'm always approachable and people can tell me whatever they want to tell me. And of course, I'm really able to filter it and to be able to say, okay, keep the, bowl, keep the meat and throw away the bones. Because sometimes the issues I'm being criticized is the person's issues that they're projecting onto me. And wisdom is being able to bring it to the Lord and say, show me which ones of these I should keep and which ones of these are just rubbish. You know? But you should never get yourself out from the place where you're not willing to learn and to listen. Amen. Amen. So you grow or you die. Number two, another reason why we can't be at Mavuno, we cannot be half-hearted. One reason why God is telling us we must always give ourselves fully is that your time is running out. Your time is running out. You see, we have one life. God gave you one life to represent Him on earth. Reincarnation is not a biblical reality. You are not coming back as a higher being. Or as a... <laughs> you are not coming. This is your one life. This is 
your one chance to serve God. You have it, and what you do with it matters for eternity. It's your one chance. Second Corinthians 5.20, it says, We therefore are Christ's ambassadors, as though Christ was making his appeal through us. I like that. It's like, you've been given a job as an ambassador. You have a town. Ambassadors have a town. And they have an assignment. Because you're far from home, you can go and just represent yourself in that foreign country. And do nothing for your home country. But a time of reckoning will come. Because your ambassadorship will end. You won't always be an ambassador. You have one opportunity to make it count. Another verse I really enjoy is Luke chapter 16. This one sobers me up. Luke 16 verse 27 to 28. Because this talks about the rich man. This guy lived his whole life making money. And he was completely wealthy. He lived the dream. He lived what many people would consider a successful life. And then he died. And he found himself in hell. And he realized he had wasted his life. And he realized even worse. That not only was he doomed in hell eternally. His brothers he had left on earth. And were about to join him. And he was like, if there was one thing I could do is to warn my brothers. And he says, he, he, he said to Father Abraham, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. I mean, can you imagine? The guy is burning and he's in torment. But he's, he's just regretting. I wish someone could warn my brothers not to come and join me. Remember how we were saying yesterday, we used to say that we'll go to hell, we'll find Ken Michael Jackson there. They are probably, the ones who are there are probably saying, God, send someone to them to tell them not to come here. This is not the place I need to be joined. It's not a good place for anybody. But you know what the guy said? He said, they, they've already, yeah, they have Moses. They already have testimony. If they won't believe, then they will not believe you. Even if you rose and came back. And you know, the funny thing is, the, the weird thing is, I suspect God would say, even if you rose from the dead. See, Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. If they won't believe, how will they believe you? Yeah. Yeah. They'll say you're a ghost, first of all. And start going to see psychologists when they see you. And they'll even cast, get pastors to cast you out. Yeah. A time will come when you will not be able to preach the gospel. To your parents, to your brothers, to your workmates. The time will come. To your spouses, it will come. And my encouragement, guys, this is your moment. You may not have the words to preach to your husband. It may not even be appropriate for you to say those words now. But my goodness, your fervent prayer could be the thing that is keeping them from God. Uh -uh, you cannot be asleep at 4.30 and that man does not know God. That woman does not know. You can't. That child doesn't know Jesus yet. You can't be asleep and hoping someone else is praying for your family. Let me tell you, your pastor is praying for his own family. <laughs> what a shock uh -uh. Pastor Kilonzi, you think he loves you, yes but he has his own issues that's why he wakes up at 4.30 uh -uh. he's praying for Pastor Faith you and, your, you and your issues just understand your pastor has it, when he say now let's pray he's not, he, he puts his hand on the screen but his mind is not on you his mind is on the fact that my God, my family needs you Jesus Yeah. so, so stop fooling yourself that when you sleep somebody else will will do it for you. Your opportunity is slipping away. You have one life and one opportunity. You need to make it count. And that's why you must be wholehearted. I told you about the woman who broke my heart when I saw her crying out. I thought, this woman understands. She's like the rich man in hell. She's like, God, save my family. Ah, she has such passion. She's wholehearted in her prayer because she understands what's at stake. And many times the reason we don't, we don't pray with such fervor is because we don't know what's at stake. Our time is running out. We can't be half-hearted. We can't be half-hearted. Not if we believe what the scripture says. That one of these days, a trumpet blast will sound in heaven. And the skies will part. And Jesus will come. At that point, guess what? If you're a Christian, you'll be glad to see your Lord. But you might also be full of regrets. Oh my God, it's too late to tell the person I should have told. You must be wholehearted for God. Number three, and the last one. And this one is another sobering one for me. Why must you be wholehearted? Because if you're not, God will find someone else. Yeah. God will find someone else. Ah, uh -uh, mercy. May God not have to find someone else. Yeah. Uh, uh, Genesis 11, 31. 
It says, Terah took his son Abraham, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham, and together they set out from Ar to the Chaldeans to go to where? To Canaan. Abraham was not the first person called to go to Canaan. It was his father. God had already appeared to his father. Told him, go to the land of milk and honey, the land I'll show you. And the man, Terah, he took his family and he struck out to that place. Now the one thing you need to know about him, he had three sons. There was Abraham, there was Neho, and there was Haran. And then the Bible says, when he reached, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. This man came to a place that reminded him of the son he had lost, the son he had loved. And he reached a place where he was paralyzed by that and he settled there. He settled and he never achieved God's calling on his life. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't become a child of terror. Don't settle. <laughs> You'll have terabytes. <laughs> That's Pastor Godwin. Trust me, that was not me. <laughs> Don't become that person. The Bible says Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. He never achieved God's purpose for him. And when he died, the Bible says in Genesis 11, that was Genesis 11, the end of 11. Genesis chapter 12 starts and the Bible says God appeared to Abraham. Because the father had not achieved it, God used the son. And the son is the one who was faithful and left everything and went to the promised land. And that's why today we say we are sons of Abraham. God used him to become the one who would, would usher in the chosen people from whom the Savior would come. My goodness, just by his wholeheartedly following God. What, imagine what could be at stake by you not obeying. God could, take a, could miss a whole generation of salvation for your family. And then he has to use your son to bring the salvation that you should have been the one to bring. So your son is not doing the work he should be doing. He's doing the work you should have done. I mean, that is neglect. It's neglect. Don't allow that to happen. And you know, it's interesting because my prayer is I would not miss my opportunity. Uh -uh. I want to do everything I should do. I want to be faithful in my generation. I want to carry out my assignment. So that by the time I leave, my family is better. The ministry is better. My, like God, God is glorified. And if Jesus doesn't come back while I'm still doing this, that when I reach my time, I will die and say it is finished. I'm done. I've done what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm happily going to join my maker. And my prayer is that every single one of you, this will be your story. You know, some people, they don't say it is finished. They say, I'm finished. It's like you got finished before your job was finished. Uh -uh, that is not your portion in Jesus' name. You will finish your race. You will, you will do the things God assigned for you. You will serve God wholeheartedly. Yeah, this is what God desires of every one of us. That we will always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. I want to just pray for us before we go for tea. Wow, see God is powerful. We've even had a better service without lights. I wish we could even come back after tea like this. This church just feels so good, you know. Some melancholics are like, hey, this is a bit too close. <laughs> huh? Melancholics, there's space. But then they're like, now everybody will be looking at me. Ay, let me tell you. God help us. God help us. The sanguines, you can all come on stage and leave the melancholics some space. <laughs> sanguines are like, yay, we're ready. We're ready, we're ready. <laughs> yeah. I want to take a moment just in your seats, just to pray for yourself. Just pray, Lord, I don't want to be half-hearted. I don't want to allow fear to sabotage my future. I don't want to allow my past to steal my future. I don't want to be that person who will miss the opportunity and you use someone else. Come on, just pray. Pray that God would give you zeal for his house to consume you. Pray that you will be wholehearted in serving God. Pray that God will just allow you opportunity to step up and grow in your faith this year. Pray that you would never be caught in laziness or sin or in discipline or fear. Those are not your portion. Just bring it before the Lord and say, God, help me. Help me to wake up early to read your word. I don't want to be lazy for the, in the things of God. Help me to wake up for prayer every day this year. I don't even want to miss one day because the devil doesn't take a day off. God, give me the grace to do it. Give me the grace to prioritize your word that I may never miss a day reading your word, getting my assignment for that day. 
Lord, help me even in my career to set spiritual goals that, Lord Jesus, my office will achieve what you wanted it to achieve. My business will achieve what, what you want it to achieve. Father, I just call you, have mercy. May I not miss my opportunity. May I not be that person who walked out through life and did not achieve what you created them for. I want to be wholehearted. I want to serve you with all my life. Lord, may people not miss heaven because of me. May not people not miss hearing about you because I was too self self-absorbed thinking about small things as opposed to thinking about the things of the kingdom Lord have mercy on me I pray for myself Lord I know my tendency but Lord I can easily be distracted I pray Lord remove distractions from me help me to have mastery over my body mastery over my eyes mastery over my mind that I will be consumed by the things of God Lord I want to even uh, read books that help me grow in my mind in my love for you and many times I find that other things distract me so I don't have time for the things that really count I'm saying Lord have mercy have mercy on me Lord have mercy on my family help us not to be lazy Lord help us to be passionate believers help us to be productive help us to be fruitful in the work of the kingdom Lord I dedicate myself to you that I will always give myself fully to the work of the Lord that my labor in the Lord will not be in vain use my strength use my youth use my energy use everything you've given me to bring glory to you in my generation I bless you Lord I bless you Lord and even as you've prayed this prayer I just sense that the Lord is faithful he hears the cry of a sincere heart that says Lord I want you to use me and so Father I pray now let your spirit just fall down upon your people the spirit of the zeal of the house of the Lord that consumes them I pray the spirit of intercession upon you God's people ah may God give you such a desire for prayer you will enjoy prayer and may God give you the ability to pray beyond even the comfort that you've experienced so far you'll find yourself prayer is over but you still want to continue praying this is your portion in Jesus' name. May God give you a hunger for his word. Much greater than a hunger for movies. A hunger for scrolling on the internet. May God just give you a hunger for his word. I pray right now. God, even begin to confirm to somebody right now. Even as I pray, give, give somebody a physical experience of you right now. That helps them to even understand that this word is for them. I pray that somebody would even begin to experience you that has never experienced you before. Just release release something in them Lord that they will begin to sense that God is with them I pray Father just affirm this word in your children and so Father we just want to thank you we just take a moment just take a moment to soak in the Lord right now uh, his power is there for you his enablement is there for you you will experience the goodness of the Lord you will see your desires come to pass you will see the Lord bringing great things to happen in your family you're going to see victory that you've never experienced because you're giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. I pray, Lord, that none of us will be half-hearted Christians. Ah, ah, that is not your portion in Jesus' name. Right now, laziness is leaving your horizon in Jesus' name. You are taking mastery over your body. You're taking mastery over your mind. This is your portion in Jesus' name. Nobody will ever call you lazy again. That is not your portion. Because God himself will energize you. He will energize you. You will never again feel I can't do it. A lack of agency is leaving your bloodline right now in Jesus' name. You will never feel again that I don't have the strength. Because you will know the joy of the Lord is my strength. May the, joy, the Lord furnish you with strength every morning. His mercy is new for you every morning. You have the authority. You have the power. I pray right now. God is opening the eyes of somebody here. You will never call yourself cursed again. You will never call yourself ask people we don't do this or we can't do this. That is not your portion in Christ Jesus. I declare over you that the Lord is empowering you right now and giving you strength to achieve greater things than you ever thought. I'm calling you distinguished. As you serve God, you are distinguished in your family. You are distinguished in your generation. Ah, you will be called blessed by your family members. I want to speak this word over somebody right now. This year, your family members are going to start coming to you for solutions. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because as they have been trapped and not even known where to go, they have felt this is our portion. Uh-uh. I'm speaking over you. You're going to be the solution provider. Yes. They will see God working in your life so powerfully. You're going to start getting calls for advice from elders in your family. They will not make decisions without you. Because they see the wisdom of God in you as you serve God wholeheartedly. Oh, yes. I declare God will give you divine solutions this year that will glorify Him. Like Daniel, 
who was distinguished wherever he served. You will be distinguished in your workplace. I speak over you distinguishing and setting apart because of your wholehearted love and service of God. Ah, Daniel was a high official of government, but he spent three, he prayed five times every day. I speak over you that you will be as passionate for God as Daniel was. And I declare that if you are passionate for God, you will be as noticed as Daniel was in his time. Because this is your portion in Christ Jesus. And so Father, I, I, I release, I release that prophecy right now for your people. And I declare that Lord, there will be testimonies. Even by the next gathering, there will be promotions by the next gathering. By people here who are dedicated to serving God. Who are excellent even in their work. They are excellent because they are not serving as unto man but as unto God. While everybody else is lazy around them, they will be dedicated, uh, dedicated workers. Because they are not serving man but they are serving God. And as they give themselves wholly to the work of the Lord, I pray Lord, ah, they will see glory. They will see the glory of the Lord wherever they go. And so I bless you God's people. I bless you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Come on, somebody give a big shout to Jesus. I bless you, Jesus.